Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you, we call your holy name. At this moment, we come unto your throne of praise, Father. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity to learn. Father, guide us, bless us, Father, lead us and share through your wisdom and knowledge, Father, so that we can gain <clears throat> the spiritual insights and learn the very deep knowledge about your uh, words as Father. Bless Pastor Deepika, Pastor, so that <clears throat> she can teach us what the great insights of our, of your words, Father. Thank you for each and every moment, Father. I dedicate myself and all the all the all all the students unto your throne of this. Thank you so much, Father, for this wonderful opportunity. I ask this prayer in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Sorry, God, Pastor. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Um. Today we would be covering John uh, chapters ten and eleven. Um. We had a small portion of John chapter nine left, uh, and uh, that forms a kind of um, background for the things that Jesus begins to say here in chapter ten. Uh, so we will just very briefly touch upon uh, what Jesus says in the last portion of um, John chapter nine, and then we will move into uh, John chapter ten because then that makes more sense. Uh, so. Uh, in the very last portion of uh, John chapter 9, after Jesus has healed the blind man and um, uh, the blind man has placed his faith in Jesus and, uh, you know, he worships him, um, then uh, the uh, Pharisees are against him for doing this and they actually excommunicate him. Uh, it says that they throw him out. Uh, so uh, when that happens, uh, this is what Jesus says. So uh, if we were to look at John chapter 9, um, verses 39, 40, and 41, um, Jesus says this. He says, uh, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Uh, and when he makes this ironic statement, the Pharisees say, uh, are you trying to indicate that we are blind? Uh, and then he says, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, you your guilt remains. Uh, so basically here, uh, the Lord is saying that again and again, I have tried to point out to you Pharisees uh, that you know I am from the Father and what I am speaking is the truth. Uh, but uh, you have chosen to continue being spiritually blind um, and you have not accepted what I have said. Uh, but in your mind, you believe that what you are saying is true and and even though a lot of evidence is being given to you that to show that you are wrong you're choosing to continue to close your eyes and ignore those facts so he is saying anyone who is willing to you know look at the data consider the evidence and admit yeah i think we may have been mistaken i think we have been blind regarding this thing and now based on all the evidence which jesus is presenting maybe we need to correct ourselves correct our ways and you know rethink uh, our um, earlier beliefs and maybe we should now place our faith in jesus so all those who are willing to admit their spiritual blindness based on the evidence which jesus is presenting such people, uh, you know, there's no guilt uh, held, uh, I mean, no no judgment held against them, simply because uh, the Lord will be willing to uh, forgive them uh, because they are repentant. But someone who says, no, 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 I am not blind, even though they can see all of the evidence and they're still refusing to admit their spiritual blindness, such people, um, there's only judgment left for them uh, because they can see the evidence and they can sense that what they are saying is wrong and still they stubbornly hold on to the uh, you know to the uh, to the wrong things that they are claiming even though all the evidence that jesus is providing is pointing in the opposite direction here was a man who had been completely blind from birth um, and uh, now he's miraculously healed and in spite of that so which is why in fact in the if you if you look you know in the latter part of john chapter 9 the blind man himself he says how remarkable it is you know that you don't know who this person is because uh, someone who can heal 
must definitely be from God. And uh, so he finds it remarkable, the blind man finds it remarkable that uh, even after evidence like this, these very learned leaders are unable to uh, figure out who Jesus is. So this is a very deliberate blindness where they have chosen uh, to, to continue believing what they want to believe. And they are uh, refusing to accept the fact that they are blind, that they are wrong. Uh, so Jesus says your guilt will, guilt will remain on you because you are uh, refusing to admit your blindness. Now, immediately after this passage, we enter into the passage which talks about the good shepherd. So um, with you know keeping that uh, the things that we saw in John chapter 9 as background, uh, let's look at chapter 10. Uh, so if we could have maybe one person read out verses 1 and 2, please. May I read, ma'am? Yes, please. John chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Amen. Amen. So, um, it, uh, he begins by saying, very truly, I tell you, Pharisees. So he's very clearly addressing the Pharisees. And he says, um, the true shepherd is one who has come through uh, the right entrance uh, in the right way with the proper you know, uh, preparation. So throughout the Old Testament, uh, all the prophecies indicated that one day a Messiah would come. Uh, and it is in Ezekiel, you know, where you have that, I think it is Ezekiel 36, you know, where you have that passage where uh, uh, the Lord says that one day he will send a shepherd who will gather all the flock to himself. Uh, uh, so, so all these things about this Messiah, this mess messianic shepherd who will come, all these things which talk about um, you know, this Messiah, they are getting fulfilled in Jesus. So Jesus is saying, you know, I have come in the right way with the correct preparation and uh, all the things which were said in the Old Testament about me, you can see those things being fulfilled. Um, but you uh, Pharisees, you know, you who call yourself, uh, call yourselves leaders and shepherds of the people, you don't seem to be following uh, the Old Testament, you know, what it says about how a leader should be, about how a shepherd should be. Uh, so he points out that to them. He says, uh, even though you don't qualify um, and even though you are not really um, doing things the way a true shepherd should, you are claiming leadership for yourself. So you have not entered in the correct manner. You have not presented your uh, shepherdhood in the right manner. Rather, you are uh, forcibly, uh, you have forcibly inserted yourself as leaders by climbing in in some other way. Okay, so uh, that's the point he makes over here. He says, very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way. So here it's like Jesus is saying, you know, the Old Testament scriptures are the gateway through which I have come. They have clearly pointed to me. And now I am fulfilling all that they have said. Uh, but you seem to have claimed your leadership, your shepherdhood by climbing in through some other means because you are not fulfilling any of the requirements which are mentioned regarding a shepherd, regarding a leader in the uh, Old Testament. And uh, um, then if we can you know, continue looking at this um, imagery uh, uh, that is Jesus is using over here, uh, if we could read out verses 3 and 4, and then we, we'll, you know, we would understand this entire thing better. Uh, verses 3 and 4, please. Could we please have someone read out? Uh, the idea is that if I just go on, you know, monotonous, it's like, it's kind of boring. Uh, so if someone, you know, reads, uh, it kind of helps. 
so that it's like you know we're moving on to the next portion so if someone could please read out verses three and four to him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out and when he brings out his own sheep he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice amen right so um now um there are different ways that their shepherds of that time would um you know watch over their flock um you would have um, teams of shepherds who would go out uh, and they would go out for maybe an entire month and they would stay out there in the fields they would not come back to the town every single night uh, so literally they would be there with their sheep out in the open uh, you know day after day um, so for them they would not be so much any need of this kind of a uh, you know sheep pen that's being mentioned over here but then there would be shepherds who would only go just near the uh, you know outskirts of the towns where they are living so they would be returning back to the town uh, every day so in such cases they you know you would need a sheep pen where you can have the sheep uh, kept for the night uh, so over here uh, in this first portion, the first imagery that Jesus is using, he's talking about this kind of a uh, sheep enclosure, you know, where every night the shepherds would come back from the outskirts and uh, they would house the sheep over there in that particular uh, sheep pen. So there would be one, uh, it would be like this really large place, uh, you know, where you could probably accommodate hundreds of sheep. Uh, because you know it's not economical right each each uh, shepherd trying to come up with his own little enclosure uh, rather than that the town would probably just have maybe one or two really big uh, you know sheep pens where everyone can keep, come and keep their sheep so obviously you would have a gatekeeper you know who would kind of keep track of you know uh, whose sheep belong to whom so who has come back inside with his flock and you know and in the morning when they are walking out they should not be walking out with the wrong set of sheep so kind of the gatekeeper kind of keeps an eye on these things so over here uh, it says in verse 3 uh, the gatekeeper will open the gate to the correct shepherds the true shepherds uh, he will not allow someone to come inside and you know steal the flock uh, and go away but he will make sure that only the right person is entering inside you know to collect his sheep and go out you know to take them to pasture uh, so um, and um, uh, so it's referring to that kind of a gatekeeper so when uh, when the when the shepherd would go inside and you have all these flocks of sheep you know in different different stalls uh, that entire place would be divided into many many stalls and each shepherd would be having his bunch you know in, in a separate stall uh, so the shepherd would go in and then he would uh, you know kind of call out they would have their own uh, own uh, way of calling the sheep um, maybe some particular distinct sound which you know he would make uh, maybe he would whistle or maybe he would call out in a particular way and the sheep which have been hearing that particular kind of you know uh, voice or whistle or whatever by now this, those sheep are very familiar with that uh, with that uh, call out signal so they would immediately respond so that is what is being talked about here so when jesus talks about these things here in this passage it's something that the people are very familiar with it's something that they've seen on a day-to-day -day basis so jesus is saying you know when the shepherd goes in over there and he calls out using his you know his distinct calling uh, his sheep would immediately uh, hear him and they would recognize that okay here is our master and they would be willing to follow him um and um, um and then yeah if we could read out verses five and six please a stranger they will not follow but they will flee from him for they do not know the voice of a stranger this figures of speech jesus used with them but they did not understand what he was saying to them yeah uh so um in your textbooks, there's this uh, incident mentioned uh, where during World War I, you had some Turkish uh, soldiers who wanted to steal a flock of sheep, uh, you know, from, a, from, from somewhere near uh, Jerusalem, on the outskirts of Jerusalem. And um, when the shepherd uh, realizes that all his sheep are being taken away, he gets up and he, you know, calls out, 
um, he, he calls out in that distinct uh, you know uh, signature calling which he has for his flock uh, and so when the sheep hear that immediately they realize that they're following somebody else and they and they're hearing his voice they all come back to the shepherd and the uh, the soldiers are unable to you know lead this large flock and take it all away uh, because all the sheep come rushing back when they hear the actual real owner call out so that's basically what is being you know uh, indicated here uh, they will never follow a stranger in fact they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice okay so um jesus over here is saying uh, you leaders are trying to teach lies to the people but those who are my sheep those who are willing to open their hearts and you know hear what i am saying they will recognize the truth in what i am saying they will uh, recognize my voice and they will respond uh, because uh, he is saying that you know you pharisees what you are teaching is wrong and uh, they uh, my sheep will be able to discern that what you people are saying is wrong and they will be able to discern that what i am teaching is correct um so he talks about how he is calling all of his sheep to himself um then if we could move into verses 7 to 10 if we could have someone read out please so jesus again said to them truly truly i say to you i am the door of the sheep all who came before me are thieves and robbers but the sheep did not listen to them i am the door if anyone enters by me he will be saved and will go in and out and find pastures. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Uh, okay, so if you notice here, you have the second very truly. Okay, so uh, the first very truly was in um, the first verse, uh, chapter 10, verse 1. And now here you have the next very truly um, in what what is the verse that we read out just now uh, yeah 10 uh, 7 yeah in 7 we have again very truly i tell you uh, so here jesus is uh, you know using a different imagery earlier we talked about a sheep pen a sheep enclosure uh, now over here uh, jesus is saying i am the gate for the sheep so over here uh, he's talking about a different imagery uh, he's talking about an enclosure uh, which would be out in the fields. This is no longer in the towns. He's talking about some a kind of temporary shelter uh, that would be used for the sheep uh, when they are out in the open fields. When the shepherds have gone out for maybe a month, you know, for an entire month, they would be out there in the open uh, with the sheep. And so um, during the night, uh, sometimes they would try to find a cave or uh, you know some kind of um, temporary structure which they have built uh, you know using sticks and um, um, you know mud and things like that uh, so uh, a cave of course would be ideal but then a cave may not always be available so uh, they would form a kind of temporary enclosure to put the sheep inside that during the night um, uh, because you know because of wolves and other danger so in that case uh, the shepherd would literally sit there in the opening okay so there would be only one opening uh, and uh, the shepherd would literally sit there in the opening so that nothing can go inside and attack the sheep. So if any wolf wants to come, it would literally have to go through the shepherd. So he is there to defend his sheep. And now Jesus is using this imagery and he says, I am the gate for the sheep. I am literally there for them and, you know, and I will look after them. And uh, uh, he says that I, I will, uh, through me, whoever enters through me will be saved uh, so over here there are two um, things that jesus is implying one is that of course he would be the word gate who will defend them and protect them but also he is saying i am the gate through whom uh, uh, the sheep can enter and be saved in the sense that he is the doorway to the father so there are two um, layers of meaning here the first literal meaning would be that he's going to protect his sheep by literally being there for them as their gate. And the second is that um, through him, the people would be able to go to the father. He will be the doorway to the father. Uh, so we see these things being indicated over here. Um, and then um, uh, verses 11 to 13, if we could have someone read out, please.
I am the good shepherd. You want to go ahead? I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. Ah, uh, yes. So uh, a hireling is basically there for the hire, for the money, uh, for the pay. So he sees the sheep as a way of making money. Uh, so the sheep are over there for his benefit. He never thinks that he is there for the benefit of the sheep. He never thinks of it from that angle because he is a hireling. He has just been hired uh, and he would be paid for his work. So there's a great difference between a true shepherd and a, 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 a hireling. A hireling will always see the people as being there for his benefit uh, to, you know, uh, so that he can maybe gain popularity out of them uh, or he can gain some kind of material benefits out of them uh, or make a name for himself through them, using them. Uh, you know, that would be a hireling. On the other hand, a true shepherd realizes that he's not over there uh, with these people uh, to get what he can out of them, but rather he has been posted there uh, to benefit them, to look after them, to serve them. So a true shepherd's attitude would be completely different. And uh, this we see so clearly, right? I mean, in our uh, uh, Christian circles, um, we see shepherds whose only thought is to serve, uh, to, you know, uh, to, to grow their uh, people, uh, to really see their people develop and become all that God wants them to be. And uh, so they are literally there to serve, to, to uplift, uh, you know, to build up. And uh, their entire approach to their leadership is so different. On the other hand, you see some leaders who um, are seeing what they can get out of the flock. Uh, so, uh, you know, um, all organizations, you know, at least for the sake of uh, organization and structure and convenience you know they appoint people and they call them pastor uh, but the real pastors are the one uh, you know who earn that title based on what they are doing how they live what they do uh, the manner in which they are serving uh, that actually makes them a true pastor so yes it's true that the institution the organization that you belong to will probably you know place a title on you and formally you know call you pastor uh, but you, uh, whether you are really a true pastor or not will show up in uh, your conduct your decisions the attitude with which you know you would be doing your pastoring and uh, so that is something that we would need to uh, be very careful about you know those of us who are uh, in leadership positions uh, and those of us who have been given titles like this uh, we would have to be very careful whether we are re really living up to that title or not uh, because one day I know God is going to hold us responsible for that title. When we stand there in front of the judgment seat, he'll say, oh, okay, you were supposed to be a pastor, is it? So what kind of pastoring did you do? What kind of shepherding did you, did you do? Because that word uh, in Greek, uh, it literally means shepherd. The word pastor in Greek literally means shepherd. So what kind of a shepherd were you uh, is what the Lord would ask on judgment day. And you would be judged based on how you did your shepherding, how you did your pastoring. So it's a rather serious role um, because we are all trying to imitate, uh, you know, Jesus, the good shepherd. So are we like him? Are we shepherding with the kind of heart that he has? Or are we doing our own thing more like the Pharisees? That would become a very important question, uh, you know, on Judgment Day. Uh, yeah, coming to the next portion. I that would be verse 16. If we could have someone read out verse 16, please. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice. And there will be one flock and one shepherd. Yes. Um, so here Jesus is talking about how um, 
all the people who come to him, uh, both the people from the nation of Israel and also all the Gentile nations. So the other, uh, you know, the other sheep that he's talking about here um, probably refers to the Gentiles who will also be added to his flock. Uh, so everyone will become part of one single flock because that's what, you know, Paul says later on, right? There is no Jew or Gentile. All are one because they are all under one Lord. They are all, they all have been, you know, marked and branded by one spirit as his as his possession. So um, we are all one. And um, the shepherd would like it if all the sheep would reflect this uh, attitude, you know, rather than seeing ourselves as being better than other people, you know, one denomination thinking of themselves as being superior to another denomination, uh, rather than having that kind of an attitude. Um, if we could have an attitude where we are thinking, okay, um, these are the advantages that I have in my community. But then I see this other Christian community where, uh, you know, um, they have these strengths, uh, but they also have these weaknesses. And if we could reach out to them and maybe help them, if at all possible, you know, uh, you know, selflessly uh, reach out and help them, uh, you know, rather than just criticizing and condemning and pointing fingers, um, that probably would be an attitude that uh, the shepherd would be pleased with because he sees all of us as one single flock. Um, and uh, so he values all of us and treasures all of us equally. Uh, so we too would need to have that same attitude of, uh, of you know, us being one flock with one shepherd. Now, uh, when Jesus originally spoke these words, um, it is possible that the Jews who were listening uh, might have understood uh, these other sheep um, as, um, something from the Old Testament, because in the Old Testament, it does talk about other sheep who will be gathered back to the shepherd, you know, in Ezekiel um, chapter 37. Um, okay, Ezekiel 37, 21 to 24, uh, where it talks about how uh, this shepherd, this messi messianic shepherd whom God will send, he will gather the scattered Israelites from all the other nations. Um, because many of them had been taken away to Babylon and they did not come back. Uh, then those who had settled in Egypt and all those regions, many of them also chose not to come back to uh, you know, Jerusalem later. So all of those people also will be gathered by the shepherd in the sense he will impart his truth. He will impart his revelation even to them so that they too can have a chance to believe in him and come under his protection and his care. Uh, so. Uh, it could so when Jesus talks over here about the other sheep, um, it is probably, of course, referring to the Gentiles, but it could also be referring to all these other scattered sheep, uh, you know, the Jewish people who have uh, become part of other uh, cultures and part of other uh, nations, uh, but they too will be told the truth so that they too can be part of uh, the one true flock. Um, and um, yeah, I think it was in your textbook, right, where it talks about, um, yes, um, uh, you know, there's just a brief reference to um, uh, a Roman Catholic doctrine, uh, which in which uh, they hold to the uh, translation which was made by Jerome, you know, when he did the Latin Vulgate translation, when he translated the Bible into Latin. Uh, there he is supposed to have used the word, uh, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. And um, unfortunately, I'm sure that poor man did not mean anything wrong. Uh, it's just that when he used that particular word fold, you know, one fold and one shepherd, that particular word, word fold in the Latin language has a kind of slight um, connotation of an institution or an organization. So it's like as if he's, you know, anyone who doesn't really understand the translation and it would sound to them like as if Jesus is saying, there shall be one institution and one shepherd. And uh, so uh, the Roman Catholics, um, they at that of that time began to declare and say, see, we are the correct institution. We are the right fold. So anyone who is part of the Roman Catholic institution are the ones uh, who are under the true shepherd and the rest uh, who 
belong to other you know denominations are wrong but um, uh, i'm pretty sure that when jerome used that word uh, fold uh, he did not mean that uh, because in the greek it's very very clear that uh, the flock over here is not talking about any institutionalized um, you know uh, segment it's just talking about uh, one flock of sheep altogether all right um maybe we can uh, move on to uh maybe we could read verses 17 and 18 yes For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Okay. Uh, so here, uh, Jesus is talking about how he is uh, submitting to the father to the extent that where he is even willing to lay down his life. Okay, so uh, here he says, uh, I have the authority to lay down my life and the authority to take it up again. So even if uh, you know the father had not acted and resurrected Jesus, Jesus could have just resurrected himself on his own. But he does not do that. I mean, he uh, you know waits for the father's timing and waits for the father to resurrect him in his perfect time. Uh, so Jesus uh, does not exercise his own power, but he is pointing out the fact that he has the authority to do that. He can you know uh, take up his life, lay down his life, and take it up whenever he wishes to. But he has chosen to submit himself to the Father to such an extent where even though he has the power to raise himself up on his own, he would not do that. Okay, so um, Jesus points out that aspect of uh, of who he is. Um, maybe we could move on very quickly to uh, the next passage. If we could have someone read out verse 22, please. Okay. Yes. Uh, go ahead, Elijah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Now it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter, and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How No, long yeah, we'll, we'll just simply talk about that so that we'll have an understanding of what exactly is this uh, feast of dedication and all of that. Um, now, the one portion of the temple was called Solomon's Colonnade. Uh, it was very considered very important, very historic, because, you know, I mean, as we all know, it was Herod who built this really grand structure. Um, and uh, made the temple very grand. Uh, when the people, when the exiles came back from Babylon, they built this rather simple structure, which became the second temple. And uh, so um, it was not very grand or anything big. Uh, but when Herod came along, he was trying to you know curry favor with the locals because he himself was not a um, Jew. And so he wanted to somehow win the people over to his side. And uh, so he builds them this really grand temple. Uh, but they say that this, you know, this portion, uh, the colonnade, that actually uh, is the original structure right from Solomon's time is what they believed uh, um, because of the way the stones were, you know, um, Put together in that particular portion, they believed that this was the original colonnade which existed from Solomon's time. So um, Jesus was walking around uh, in this colonnade, and uh, you know the people came to him to hear what he is saying. And right now, there's there's something called the feast of dedication going on. Uh, what exactly was this feast? Um, it was a, a a reminder to them of you know what had happened a little earlier in the second century BC uh, when you had this um, Syrian king Antiochus Epiphanes 
Uh, so this Syrian king, when he comes to uh, Jerusalem, uh, he just wants to mock the Israelites, uh, you know, and you know, prove his superiority. He goes into the temple and he sets up uh, a statue of um, uh, Zeus, you know, one of his gods. Uh, he, he puts a statue of uh, Zeus and an altar over there. And on this altar, which has originally been, you know, created for the sacrifices to Yahweh, on that altar he goes and sacrifices pigs uh, simply because um, the pig is uh, you know uh, declared as an unclean animal you know by the lord and so he deliberately he sacrifices pigs uh, just to desecrate the temple so he does all of these things and uh, it uh, at that time the maccabeans um, you know one um, you could say maybe they're a kind of terrorist sect because you know they they are uh, maybe okay maybe we would say a military they, they didn't want to terrorize they wanted to fight so i guess we would call them a military sect uh they rise up the maccabeans they rise up and they say you know we will not put up with this we will fight for our nation we will fight for our faith and uh so they they are the ones who fight against um these uh you know forces of antiochus that have taken over the place. Many of them get martyred. Uh, many of them are, uh, you know, tortured. Uh, they are given, uh, they are given pig meat to eat, and they told, you know, eat it so that you can deny your faith. And then many of them say, no, we will not. And in fact, they die. They a lot of them die, are killed. Uh, so when we look at these, you know, this um, those historical books of the Maccabeans, uh, that's basically where we read about all this, uh, all the things which took place. So. After the uh, you know uh, the intruders are all defeated and the temple is reclaimed, they once again clean it, they sanctify it, they rededicate it to the Lord, and so this uh, this feast is in remembrance of that, in remembrance of what the Maccabeans you know did uh, when they reclaimed the temple and they rededicated it for the Lord's purposes. So this was a seven-day feast and it was considered very important in those times and at that time jesus is uh, speaking these words uh, so um, we could maybe look at uh, what are the things that he is saying um, maybe we can have yeah we we'll, let's read out verses 24 to 27 yeah 24 to 27 please 24 to 27 yes then then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe, because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Yes. Um, so uh, here Jesus says, I know that the, the, the Jews, you know, again, they come to him in Solomon's colonnade. They, they surround him and they say, you know, plainly tell us uh, whether you're really the Messiah. It's what Jesus has been telling from day one. I mean, he's, he's, he's told it in so many different ways. And now it's rather ridiculous, you know, at this point, again, they're asking, they're saying, you know, plainly tell us whether you are the Messiah. And uh, so now Jesus says, you know, if you were my sheep, you would have clearly heard what I have been saying all along. But because you are not my sheep, you're unable to hear what I am saying. And, you know, we see, uh, we see something similar to this in uh, Matthew 13, 11 to 15. Uh, so if we could actually turn in our Bibles to that passage, Matthew 13, 11 to 15. Um, and I think it would be good if we could actually read that uh, because there it talks about people who are not, you know, God's sheep. And uh, um, what, I mean, what is the Lord's attitude towards them? So Matthew 13, 11 to 15, if we could have one person read out, please. Matthew 13, 11 to 15. 15. It says, he answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. 
Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the pro prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear, and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. Amen. So here, the um, you know the wording here, it so clearly describes these people that Jesus is now speaking to. He says, you know, Jesus says, uh, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. And then in the previous verse, verse 26, he says, you do not believe because you are not my sheep. And we see uh, such a clear description of such of that category of people here in Matthew 13, you know, where Jesus is quoting the uh, passage from Isaiah. And he says, you know, those of you who really care about these King, you know these things of the kingdom you are able to understand and because you have that little bit and you are and you and you have a desire to to hold on to that little bit of truth which i have given you more will be given to you i will reveal more to you uh, your knowledge will increase on the other hand those who are not willing to even accept that little bit which i have revealed even that little will be taken away from them, he says. And then quoting from the Isaiah passage, one very interesting that he say, a thing that he you know brings out at the very end in verse 15, he says, for this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. You see, nobody made them close their eyes. It's a choice which they have made. They chose to close their eyes. They are, they are spiritually blind because they have chosen to be spiritually blind. And yet they declare, no, we are not blind. Uh, so it's a deliberate choice which they have made because they are not his sheep and they have no interest in following him. So when, G uh, so when Jesus goes on to say, I and the Father are one, uh, they immediately get very angry and uh, you know they want to, um, they, 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 they again try to stone him. And uh, and then at that time, um, yeah, at that time, Jesus says, uh, maybe we can actually look at, um, yeah, maybe verse 31 and 32, if we could read out. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them. I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? Okay, so answer him. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, that that, that should do. Um, so uh, earlier, when they tried to stone Jesus on another occasion, he just quietly slips away. But here he uh, does not just quietly slip away. In fact, he speaks up and he says, "I have done all these good works from the Father. For which of these good works are you now getting ready to stone me?" Uh, is what he says, uh, because these works that he's doing are the clear proof that he is from the Father. They are the evidence. They are the signs that he is genuine, that he's genuinely the Messiah. And uh, in spite of knowing that, in spite of having seen that, here they are getting ready to stone him. And so he's giving them one more opportunity to look into their hearts and, and see why are they stoning him, the motive of their heart. Are they stoning him because they are, uh, you know, concerned that he is wrongly declaring himself to be sent from the Father, or are they stoning him because he's not the kind of Messiah that they had been looking for? They had wanted something else, and now he is not what they want. He is, in fact, opposing them and pointing out the dirt in their heart and is asking them to change their ways. It's a lot of inconvenience. They did not want any of that. They just wanted someone who would deliver them from the hands of the Romans. So. Um, uh, so he says, all my works are clearly proving who I am. So based on all of this evidence, which portion of the evidence are you actually now stoning me for? And he goes on to talk about uh, you know, his works. So in verse 25, he says, um, the works I do in my father's name testify about me. They are the testimony. And he, in fact, he stresses this point again and again. He says in verse 37, 
do not believe me unless i do the works of my father but if i do them even though you don't believe me believe the works that you may know and understand that the father is in me and i in the father so because earlier when he said i and the father are one that is basically why he said it it's because his works are proving that he is in the father and the father is in him so you know again and again so plainly jesus is giving them very clear opportunities to change their thinking and repent and accept him uh, so on judgment day no one can say you know that uh, he did not give them every opportunity to change their mind uh, he did but the sad truth you know like he points out they have closed their eyes they have deliberately chosen to close their eyes to all of these uh, truths and um, mm -hmm. We, we would need to touch upon this portion where it talks about, I have said you are gods, and if he called them gods. So maybe we can uh, do that after we come back from our break. Uh, yeah, we will touch upon this passage, uh, verses 34 onwards, and then we will I know move on to other things. Uh, so right now, maybe we can go for our break, and we'll come back, of course, at uh, 10 o'clock. Thank you. <laughs> 